Okay, I'm just going to go backwards in time a little bit and uh, talk about uh, software apps and suites that are available for the PCs and how do the app uh, concept on mobile device differ from that. Um, I just think about um, oh, Microsoft Office or WordPerfect Office or even Open Office. Um, all of those have essentially the same problem, that is they are bloated. Um, and what I mean by that is that the software code tries to do everything um, for everybody. So you end up with this big piece of software that has all kinds of functions in it that most people will never ever use. But you pay for it. Yes, uh, and that's it. I'm just interrupting right here. I got one of my um, one of my online students uh, presently coming in and, and asking me a question on Skype as we carry on this conversation. Um, but uh, yeah. I, I agree with that a lot. We, you go ahead and, and let's say uh, you take a look at, and you know, poor Microsoft's always hanging out there, right? Because of what they try to build, and, and same like uh, Adobe now with Photoshop, etc. Right? Um, the expense is big on the front end, right? That there's a cost to that uh, to that uh, incredible piece of software. All those people involved, the marketing and everything, makes it very expensive, um, which is is one issue by itself. Um, it has so much functionality, like you're saying, I, I did a, uh, Colin Jago and I, we did a presentation at Minds on Media a little while ago on Photoshop. Um, and uh, we started off with <clears throat> about seven or eight things, and we only had an hour, right? We were like seven or eight things we were going to kind of try to get their heads around. Well, you know what happens about 15 minutes in is you get, yeah, <laughs> you get through a couple, and then there's somebody at the back who's been playing with Photoshop for the last four years, and they say, well, can you help me do this? And I'm going, no, I, I don't know how to help you do that because, I mean, the, but this, cause the, the possibilities in, inside that software are so huge and the, uh, you know, the, the specific things that you can do with it that are addressed with uh, directly to it um, just cause, you know, confusion, I guess, is, is there's no better use of it, word for it, than confusion. And that's where, again, the app has that pointed one-off thing, which is a strength, maybe, by itself. Now, the other interesting thing is, I mean, if you take a look at any of those suites and you can come up with, it, it really doesn't matter who, who's creating them, but there's always, you know, two, three, four, five different ways of doing exactly the same thing as well. You know, so that certainly does not help in reducing the confusion as we're going forward. There's even, a, as, a, as a trainer, you know, when I was working so much at the school board talking and teaching software to, to other teachers, it actually muddies the waters a lot, right? Because you'll be making a presentation to somebody and say, okay, we're going to do this. And they go, oh, you know, I do it this way. And then, oh, well, I did it this way. And then the whole conversation goes away from the, from the learning to this conversation about the doing of. And, you know, like, it's not extending your ability anymore. It's, it's kind of holding you back. Right. Okay, let's uh, move on to the the, uh, the last question here, or the last set of questions. Um, so, what is BYOD and ubiquitous compute, mobile computing all about? How does BYOD change the experience of the IT environment within institutions and corporations? And then we'll see if we can actually bring all of this back to uh, wrapping up the conversation, uh, looking at adult education, and teaching and learning within education context and environments. So let's start with the BYOD and ubiquitous mobile computing. The top there. Okay. All right. So uh, BYOD is again an, just a knockoff on the bring your own other things, and in this case, it's bring your own device. Um, and uh, it is kind of a party, isn't it? It's it's uh, you bring these into a to a uh, place of learning, and uh, you know what? I'm not the smartest guy in the room anymore, and I love that. Um, so they come in the door, they bring in their devices, and uh, we can go ahead and, and have a, a learning party. You know what I mean? We need to know stuff. We need to access things. We need to speak with someone else in the world. Um, we need to be able to reach out and, and thin those walls of our classroom. We can. So, And that doesn't mean whether it's a classroom or a workspace or industry, whatever it is, you've just enabled this, this whole thinking to get so much better. Um, we did a presentation, uh, excuse me, not a presentation, a, a think tank uh, here where we're developing our technology plan for our school board when I was in the in consultant role. Um, and we uh, were able to pop out and get, you know, using our devices, get feedback from a network of individuals who weren't in the meeting. Um, and so we had, let's say, 15 people's brains in there, you know, smoking away on this idea. And then we could go ahead and reach out 
I can go and say, I know somebody who really knows a lot about that. And, you know, you could send them a, a text. And next thing you know, you could hook them in by Skype and add it to the meeting. So it allows for an awful lot of functionality to take place. And uh, it's really, I think, the way of the future to get rid of these controls that exist inside of most networks that would have made that actually almost untenable. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, the, the flip side of this is while it's actually empowering the individual uh, to be able to bring their own device and therefore their own experiences and um, being able to reach out and do the, the thinning of the walls that you were talking about, it also causes huge headaches for the IT departments because now they're going to be expected to support all of that and there is absolutely no way with the budgets and the personnel that we have, the resources that are available, that that's going to occur. So can you talk just a little bit about what the IT departments are going to be seeing as a result of you know, this proliferation of mobile devices that are coming in, and how is that going to change the role of IT um, as we move forward? I think, you know, and I, and I know it's a bit of a stretch, but it's almost like IT becomes like the OS um, for a, for this uh, uh, you know in a, in a digital m mobile world. Um, the I, uh, the IT departments are able to build layers on which these all these other things can ride. Um, and if they can take that concept in their minds, and they have to do a lot of mind shift shift, because I think an awful lot of experience I've had with IT is a, a master-slave relationship, and I use those terms exactly because remember back in the days when we used to build our own computers, and you went ahead and set the uh, the um, jumpers in the master or slave role, depending what device was going to be controlled, what part of the OS, and um, that's exactly how they've always seen. Um, a, a network environment. It's something they control, lock down, keep safe, enable only this amount of functionality, um, go to those full-blown pieces of software that you and I were just talking about um, that had, you know, carte blanche ability. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the new terminology is server and client, which is, is, is a way better terminology for certain. Um, and uh, in our, in my role, like, you know, I, I see this possibility of if they can just get their heads around the allowing of freedom inside of a system that they still control that interface layer, um, then we could really launch out and go somewhere. And they could actually save money because right now we, we have to provide, we provide three to one um, ratios of computers to kids in our school. Um, office is the same thing. But if somebody's walking into my school with his own iPod in his pocket or her own uh, you know, BlackBerry or whatever in her, in her pocket, um, they can do an awful lot of the things with that um, piece of hardware, um, software that they've added themselves to do something that is actually good for this learning environment, you know? Right, and, and uh, we can go further than just talking about uh, the relevant experiences within a learning environment and talk about the uh, experiences that have been playing out over the last 12 18 months um, in other parts of the world. Uh, it, it's the it's been uh, said anyways that uh, some of the revolution that have occurred in places like Egypt and Libya and to a certain extent in other places in the world have everything to do with the ubiquitous uh, nature or the ubiquitous access to uh, mobile technology and uh, Twitter for for. Um, to a large extent has been attributed uh, to having this, to allowing for the emancipation of individuals within their own political structures. Did you want to comment a little bit more on that? I think you and I have talked one time about uh, something that's really important, I think, and that's that extension of voice. Technology allows you to have that voice somewhere in the world. We've never, and that's been locked down culturally in a lot of cases, right? I, I traveled um, for a lot of, uh, in my own field experience, spent two and a half years in West Africa um, and during the war in Angola. So I understand how sometimes if an organization or a country wants to go ahead and, and quiet anything to be said, they can surely do it in a heartbeat um, under the old system of communication, right? They can just shut it down and nothing leaves. But that doesn't happen now. I mean, we even saw that horrible situation with the young girl who was murdered in, in the Middle East, right? You know. Um, but it brings home and enables the rest of the world to know it's what's going on out there. And more importantly, it makes that place somehow accountable to the rest of the world. 
right? And so if a change needs to happen, there are more pressure there than there ever could be before. Doors used to close and you didn't hear anything, but now doors can't close anymore. And we can, uh, and, and I get really, I think this is really an important piece uh, about bringing um, a demo democratized world. And it may, you know, we just went through Arab Spring or, or are in the process of Arab Spring, right? Taking on a good, and we know that mobile devices are huge in third world nations. Again, for the same reasons, they're affordable. They don't require huge networks to run on, those kind of things. So we end up, I don't know, maybe we, historians look at this time, will they find that it was really augmented truly? by the fact that a lot of the information could flow in and out. Um, it, it's yet for the history books to show us, but I would, I would estimate that there's definitely going to be a part played by it. Okay, we, we are rapidly running out of time, so I'd like to bring this back to the adult education, uh, teaching and learning. Perhaps we can say a couple of words about the implications of mobile devices and the whole BYOD uh, movement to curriculum, how that plays out inside classrooms or uh, doesn't bring, um, yeah, allows us to actually move outside of the concept of classroom, etc., cetera, um, so that it becomes truly uh, a lifelong learning experience that can happen any place, any time. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful piece, you know, I mean, I think we're at a stage that we probably would have loved got to have gotten to 20 years early, earlier and if uh, you know Berners Lee had been able to, you know, give his expression of what the what the internet was to look like um, in the, in his future, which is our now, um, I think it would have been an awful lot like we're seeing. We we now don't have to be restricted by having access to something, someone who knows. Um, we can find someone uh, who knows anywhere now, right? Um, an example that I can give really quickly, a, a guy that I know wanted to teach his son Scratch, uh, which is a little programming language, right? He couldn't find anybody who, who wanted to teach his son Scratch. So he uh, put his stuff out there on Skype um, to try to find access to some of these people. He used Twitter, an awful lot of that was done on mobile devices. Um, and he found a teacher, um, but he had to be uh, offline by 11 o'clock at night. The guy was in Scotland, but because he was only nine years old, um, it was uh, necessary for him to get offline before the little guy went to his bedtime. So the whole world can become your teacher. You're, there's, play, there's somebody out there somewhere who can do what you want and bring it to you. The, the smartest guy in the room anymore is now the smartest, smartest lady in the room is the one who had to know how to make those connections. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, uh, a wonderful opportunity to um, talk about uh, a lot of these kinds of questions, and I'm sure that we'll have a lot more uh, discussion as we're going through the entire process of um, dealing with the tutorial sessions and the implications within um, uh, all of the different kinds of environments, uh, learning environments that are represented by people in the class. Uh, do you want to have uh, one last word before we uh, sign off? Well, not really. I, I just, you know, I do want to thank again because this is really interesting stuff to me. Uh, it'll be interesting for us to play this back 15 years from now and uh, and see how that plays out. Um, we, we can probably watch it on our on our uh, eyeglasses, kind of built-in uh, piece of technology that allows us to look back with. It'll be interesting to see if uh, YouTube is still around at that point in time, whether this video is still going to be sitting in YouTube. It'll probably be sitting in Dropbox if that exists as well. But anyways, uh, great talking with you, and thank you so very much for this. Um, look forward to having uh, further conversations as we go through the rest of the course. Thank you very much, Rob. Bye.